This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My guest today is Scott Drummond. Scott, I am so happy to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. You have an amazing story, and I want to get to it. It all happened when you were 28 years old, and it completely changed your life. So can you take us to that point in your life and then lead us into your near-death experience? Sure. Well, I was 28 years old, and I was working out of town a lot. In fact, I was working three out of four weeks out of town. And earlier years, it was all about money. Um, everything was. And what I did is I lost track of my family. And I ta- we had three kids at the time. My wife and I are married. But we uh, lived two separate lives. And I was very selfish at the time. Because growing up, I didn't have much because I come from a broken family. But I wanted to make something of myself. And so I did basically everything I could to get ahead. And I was fortunate. I played, you know, college sports, baseball. I played professional basketball over in Europe. And so I saw money and I, I kind of knew what it was about, but I tried to take it to a different level. When I was 28 years old, I came home one weekend uh, to see the family at Christmas time, and we had a good Christmas together. But as as a selfish person as I was, I called a friend of mine and we went skiing at Park City. And I love to ski. I've been skiing since I was a little boy, and I, I live in ski country here in, in Utah. And so Park City was nothing unusual to me. We, I called a friend. We went up there. We knew that there was going to be a fresh powder snow. And anybody that skis knows that when there's fresh powder, there's nothing like making the first tracks on the hill. So we, we went skiing and we had a ball at about, oh, 10 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. We were in the, in the lift line and we were bragging about our first runs and the jumps that we were making, the moguls we were hitting. And, and uh, looked over to the side and there was a, a lady coming towards us. It caught my eye because her poles were going every, every which way. And we turned to look and she ran into us. It was like, you know, taking a bowling ball and hitting the pins, you know, and getting a strike. Well, she got a strike and knocked down a few of us there in the line. And we picked her up and we we brushed her off and we got her on her way and didn't think anything more of it. And I skied the whole rest of the day. And I had it the time of my life. And we got through about 4, 4.30 and went down to the car and, and started taking my boots off. And, you know, the old style boots are a lot different than they are now. They're made out of metal. And so it take, took a little work to get them off. And, and I, I got my, my skis undone from my boots and, and I put, took my glove off. Uh, took my left one off first, I took my right one off, but something looked funny because I put my hand up like this and my fingers were going up, but my thumb was hanging down along the side of my wrist. And what had happened during that accident was, uh, she ripped my thumb out, and I didn't even know it. It was so cold that day, and the equipment back then was not as good as it is now. And I just was numb for the day. But I knew when that happened that, uh, you know, I I dislocated my thumb playing sports. But there was no way I could put this one in, and a Band-Aid just wouldn't fix it. And so we called my wife, and, of course, back then, you know, in the early 80s, we, there was no cell phones. So we went inside the ski resort and called my wife. And we were probably about an hour away from home. And she got the surgeons all ready, the doctors ready for me. So we made the trip down the mountain. And uh, I remember that being one of the longest trips I've ever had because as, as the car warmed up, uh, the pain became increasingly worse. And so when we pulled into the 
to the hospital. Of course, my wife had everything set up. And they took me in and, and got me in rather quickly and started rushing me into the operating room. And I'll never forget that experience because I looked over at my wife. I didn't thank her. I didn't tell her I loved her because it was something that I just never grew up with. I didn't tell my tell her to tell our kids that I loved him, and I'll, I'll, that even haunts me today. It's almost like I'm reliving it every single day that I did not do those type of things. Uh, but anyway, I went into the operating room, said goodbye. We'll see you when I get out. And they took me in. They, uh, the anesthesiologist uh, with, that was supposed to take care of it and put me out was called away on an emergency. And so they, they opted to go with a bear block because the doctor knew how that procedure worked. What they do is they raise your right arm, drain the blood out of it, and then they put a air tourniquet on your arm, on your upper part of your arm and your bicep area. And it has two valves on it. Well, back then the valves were run manually by a person rather than a machine like they are today. And they put a sheet between me and where the doctor was operating on so that I couldn't see what he was doing. But I could hear him because they, what they did is they did a local in my hand. It was not a serious uh, operation. It was something this doctor had done many times. Well, the nurse had never done this procedure before. And so she depended on the doctor to tell her what to do and he felt confident. Well, as my hand was laid out, I could hear them talking. They were talking about how they were going to cut a tendon out of my forearm, wrap it around my thumb, put a pin in it, sew it back up, and it would be a rather quick surgery. As the surgery started, um, I felt pressure coming from my arm, and I asked if they could relieve that pressure. Well, having the two valves up on my arm where that tourniquet was, what you do is you you release the valve in one, but you always make sure that the other valve is closed. And the, she relieved it the first time. It felt great. And I sat there and conversed with the doctor as he was operating. And as the surgery went on, the pressure came on again. And so I asked if he could relieve the pressure again. Well, instead of the nurse closing the first one and opening the second one, she just opened it. And what happened next was I felt a the medicine go up my right arm, across my chest, and into my heart. And the next thing I realized, I was standing above my body watching the operation and looking at myself down on the table wondering, what are you doing laying down there on the table? Well, what, I, what happened next was is, is I watched a lot of commotion in the room. As I saw, looked over at the machines, and there was a flat line. I I knew something was wrong, and the nurse went running out of the operating room, saying that she had killed me. And then all of a sudden, a, a whole group of people come running in, and was trying to revive me. And there was a lot of commotion. What was interesting is I could hear everything verbally. Then something else, something happened. There was a person that. Uh, was standing beside me. And he spoke to me through my mind, which is something that I never, you know, even to this day, how do we speak to our minds? It's not something that is real. And we stood there and we watched the operation and the doctor was so diligent. He, uh, he finished the operation. I watched him take the tendon out of my arm made two incisions to take it out and wrapped it around my thumb. There was a pin that was going that he had for my thumb that was a little long. And I remember watching him being precise to cut that pin so that it wouldn't protrude through the skin. And then I started to watch him as he started to stitch me up in different parts of my thumb and up on my arm part. Then uh, the voice came to me in my head saying that it was time to go. I, there was no question that I was leaving because the person that was standing beside me, I was definitely in charge of what was going on. 
I went to somewhere, <clears throat> Heather, that was, it was the most beautiful place that I have ever been. I was standing in a field. And when I was on above my body, that, that person that was with me was on my right side. But when I was standing in the field, that person was standing beside me on my left side. I don't think there was any rhyme or reason behind that. I think it was just where he happened to be standing. But one thing he told me through my mind was that I was never to look back. Never look back. And I'll never forget that saying. In fact, I wake up every day with those words in my head. And what I was able to do is I was able to look forward. I was able to look all the way to my left, all the way to my right. And it was almost like a panoramic type view. I wasn't very far away from the cloud that was in front of me. In fact, there was three clouds, but the cloud in the middle was the most unusual looking cloud. If you ever seen pearl on a car and you see the purples and the blues and the blacks in that pearl color, that's what that middle cloud looked like. And it was very, very vivid what that cloud looked like to me. Well, I looked to my left, and far to the left were some tall trees. And they were most beautiful trees that I have ever seen. If you've ever seen like a, well, when I, when I first saw them, it was like I had been to the whole forest up in the, uh, up by Forks, Washington. And they were big trunks, but no branches, kind of like a sequoia tree. And you look up at the top and the leaves are up on top. And I remember studying those leaves. The colors were just magnificent. They were the most vivid, bright colors that I'd ever seen. And there was reds and burgundies, and there was greens, two different colors of greens, and yellows. And But what was unique is I looked at the bottom of the leaves, and they were all a gold color. Now, when you look at a trunk on a tree, they look dirty. But these trunks were magnificent. They were the most beautiful brown with a gold trim on them. And after looking at them, I, to my left and to the right of the trees was some wildflowers. And these wildflowers were brilliant, brilliant colors that I can't, I can't even describe how beautiful those colors were. But the unique thing about the flowers were they were all facing towards me as if to give me energy that I had never felt before. And that energy pro projected love. Now, when you look at a plant, you have to walk all the way around it to see the flowers and the leaves. And these were all facing towards me. And it was almost like they were flowing towards me because there was no wind where I was at. But they were. it was like they were just flowing towards me. And I'll, I'll never forget the brilliant colors. They were up to about my waist. And I remember putting my hand over the top of them and feeling the energy coming out of the tops of those flowers. On the right of me and straight, uh, directly in front of me was grass. And this grass was beautiful. It was up to my waist. The bottoms were green but the tops were gold tipped and there were individual strands all facing towards me as if to send me their love for being there and i thought and this is i thought it was great you know because i'd never ever ever felt love like that in my life and i don't know if you have ever experienced total peace or not heather but total peace is an unbelievable feeling no anxiety, no fears, nothing to worry about. It was just peaceful. And that's what this grass and this, these flowers and these trees uh, showed to me. It was just an energy that was un undescribable. Also, in, in this experience, <clears throat> behind the clouds were rays. I don't know if you've ever seen sun coming through clouds or not, but that was similar to what I saw. It was a 
uh, iridescence color blue. It was the brightest blue I have ever seen that was surrounding those clouds. And I remember there was no wind at all. It was just pure peace. And it was like those rays were putting arms around me, but the grass and the flowers and the trees were kind of wrapped around me and pushing me forward. And I started to walk a little bit uh, forward because I, it was, it was a feeling that I had that I, that I was supposed to do. And as I started to walk, I noticed the person that had brought me to that location was not there any longer. And the next thing that happened, Heather, was something that I never would have expected. I watched a video of my life. I watched from the day I was born and I was put on my mother's chest to the day I died when I was 28 years old. And I watched good things. I, I watched bad things. And some things I was proud of, some things I was not very proud of. But one thing that I noticed while I was going through this video is all of the toys that I had acquired before I was 28 years old, you know, they wasn't there. None of those riches were there with me. I didn't see any boats or motorhomes or RVs. I mean, SUVs or all the cars that we've had, none of them were there with me. And I, in going through this video of my life, and it's when I'm talking about video, um, it's not one where you see that on a prescri uh, projection screen. It was in my mind, and I lived it. I lived everything that I had done from zero to 28. And I watched what my parents did for me to, for all my sports. They got me to all my activities and. I watched my brothers and sisters grow up, and I watched my parents struggle because of all the money they had to put out on me on my sports. And after it was over, watching this video, I said, well, it's over. You know, I'm dead. Uh, I accept what's going to happen next, and here we go. But the unique thing was, Everything was done with love. I mean, most people would feel anger or disappointment or something was going to happen bad to them. It wasn't that way at all, Heather. It was the most peaceful experience that I've ever had. Everything that was discussed, that was, discussed was black or white. There was nothing on the fence. And there was nobody there for me to say I didn't do that or let me explain how that happened. It was black or white. And I had accepted everything that had happened, and it was all done with love. It was, a, it was an experience that I visualize every single day. And I hope next time I have a better report, because the first one wasn't very good. Yes, that's what we're all striving for. Heather, the next part of it was a voice came through my mind to walk forward. And as I walked forward, I could feel the grass and the flowers and the trees pushing me forward. And I could feel the rays from behind those clouds pulling me towards that cloud. And like I said before, there were three of them. I don't know the significance of the other two. I only know that the one in the middle is the one that I walked towards. When I walked up to the cloud, an arm came through, and it was this much of an arm. So I saw the arm, the forearm, and I saw the hand. And I'll never forget because that hand had fingers like this, and the thumb was extended, and it was facing right towards me, but it was on an angle. So I felt like in my mind that that person was taller than me. And I'm 6'3", and I weigh 260. I'm not a small man. But I studied. I had a chance to study his arms. 
And I remember looking at his forearm and seeing how strong it was. And his hands were bigger than my hands. They were much meatier than my hands. It was almost as if he had been in construction or a farmer or, you know, now I think of a, as a carpenter, you know. But I, I'll never forget studying those arms and hands. And then it came time for me to, to grab the hand. And all of a sudden that hand pulled back. And I grabbed for it again. I mean, I grabbed for it twice because I wanted to catch that hand before it got away from me. And the voice that came to me was, it is not yet your time. You have more things yet to do. And that's word for word. I hear that word every single day. It is not yet your time. You have more things yet to do. The next thing I knew, I was laying on the table, the gurney that was being pushed out of the operating room and had a sheet over my head and I pulled the sheet off my head and the doctor just about freaked out because on my chest was a death certificate saying I'd been dead for 20 minutes. Wow. As he willed me out of the room, my wife was out in the uh, uh, waiting room and the doctor went running over to my wife and said, he's okay. Everything went fine. We brought him back. Well, my wife knew nothing that was happening. For three days, Heather, I felt total peace. And I have never, ever felt that ever in my life before. And every day that I thrive for that feeling. The things that I learned, Heather, was incredible. I I learned, luckily, at a 28 years old, you know, I got the boot. I got sent back. You know, I got another chance. But I learned it was how important it was to treat other people. Now, why did I wait until I was 67 to tell my story? I've been living with this for a lot of years. And every every day since I was 20 years old, I see what what had happened to me. And if it wouldn't have been for a friend of mine coming up to me on the river trail one day and saying, I had heard you were, was not afraid to die. And I told him, that's, that's right. I'm not afraid to die. He said, how would you like to tell your story? And I said, no. He says, I think he might be able to help a few people. And I said, no. The third time he asked me, he says, you know, there's a lot of people dying of COVID right now. And people need hope with their lives. And I think you might be able to help them. And I walked away from him. Went home. I, 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 it was, it was, I knew I wasn't going to say anything because I had already decided that I was taking my story to my grave. My wife knew bits and pieces about my experience. The kids knew virtually nothing. And we have four kids now. <clears throat> we're, we're fairly religious people. And my wife said, well, maybe maybe you need to pray about it. It might be time. And I went back and I prayed about it. And the first thing that happened was it, it was all about the one. And I went, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm the one. Thinking, what, why me? And then the next thing that came to me was uh, Christ talking to the shepherd. Uh, and asked him how many sheep he had. And he said, I have a hundred sheep. He said, well, what happens when one of your sheep uh, leave the flock? Well, I go after him. Well, what do you do with the other 99? They'll be just fine. What do you do when you find that one sheep? I throw them over my shoulders and I rejoice and I go back and celebrate with the other 99. And right then I went, I can help one person to have hope. I'll do it. And I called him back. His name is Wes Lapioli. 
I said, Wes, I'll do it on one condition. Just let me tell my story and I'll walk away. And this is how serious I was about doing it, Heather. I walked in an old golf shirt, old beat up shirt. I said, I'm here to tell my story and I'm walking away because no one's going to want to hear my story anyway. And I told him that story. He respected what I had to say. The interview was over. And now, you know, three years later, Heather, I'm talking to people all over the world. It is so humbling to have written the book that we just finished and having people taking pictures of their books all over the world and sending me pictures. I wrote a book called What Dying Taught Me About Living. And it came out the end of July. And it's been overwhelming, the response from... <laughs> I, can't, I can't count how many countries they've sent me pictures of the book and have thanked me for sharing my, if you want to call it testimony, uh, it. I tell them it's just me. It's just a story. It's just an experience that I had. And it was something, Heather, that I would have been happy to take to my grave. And I, and I it, uh, when I told my story, it was like something got lifted off my shoulders. And I wonder, even today, if I was saved until this time in my life, or I've had years to think about it and make changes to my life, that it was a chance for me to share what experiences I've had over the years. You know, I'm, I'm not young anymore, Heather. I've been retired since 2005. My wife and I have been thoroughly happy with traveling and just enjoying life. And then this happened and um, this is a different chapter in our lives. Well, I am so glad that you decided to share your story. I am so glad that you are sharing it with us today. And I do think that you are changing lives. There's a lot of people that are going to hear this and really be touched by your story. And there's so much more still to talk about because I want to talk about some of the things you mentioned in your book. I want to talk about heaven a little bit more and some of the things that you saw and that you experienced. But let's go ahead and take that into part two. Thanks so much for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. That was part one. Make sure to listen to part two. And if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more episodes.